Hello, I'm Annabel Brodie Smith, Communications Director of the Association of Investment Companies. With inflation now running at a 40 year high of 9% and predicted to rise, many investors are concerned about how high levels of inflation will impact their portfolios. Certain investment companies investing in property and infrastructure assets are able to provide inflation linked income. But how are they managing to do this? And what's the outlook for infrastructure and property in this challenging environment? Today, I'm delighted to be joined by three investment company managers, Giles Frost, Director of International Public Partnerships, Andrew Cowley, Manager of Impact Healthcare REIT, and Edward Hunt, Manager of Hickel Infrastructure. Right, on to the questions. How is your company well positioned to protect investors' returns from inflation? And I'm gonna ask that question to Giles. Thanks, Annabelle. Um, how, we, how are we positioned to protect investors from inflation? Well, I think the simple answer is we've been doing it for the last um, 15 years. Um, our dividends have grown by two and a half percent per annum, which exceeds inflation over the last 15 years. But of course, the future is a different thing from the past. So um, the reason why we're confident about inflation protection in our assets is because of the nature of those assets. We invest in public infrastructure. So these are the essential assets of communities, schools, health centers, courthouses, train services, and so on. And the reason we're confident about inflation is because the revenues we receive are generally inflation linked. It's not a perfect match but around about 70% of our, of our revenues are inflation linked, such that for every 1% increase in inflation, we expect around about a 0.7% increase in our returns. Thanks very much, Charles. That's really clear. Andrew, how is your company well positioned to protect investors' returns from inflation? Well, we hope we're well positioned. We're going to find out in the next, next year or two. Um, so when we set the business up five years ago, we, we thought there are two important principles we wanted to have in all our leases. So first is long term. Typically, we're putting new leases in place of 25 to 30 years with no break clauses. And second, inflation linkage. So 100% of our leases today are inflation linked. But coming back to something Giles just mentioned, I think it's also very important, you can put anything you like in a lease or a legal agreement, but will it, will it actually work in reality? And our, our tenants are providing an essential social infrastructure, and they demonstrate over the last 20 years that they have a lot of pricing power in an inflationary environment that we're now in. Excellent, Andrew. Sounds like you're planning well there in advance for an inflationary environment. Um, Ed, how is your company well positioned to protect investors from inflation? Uh, yeah, it's a good point. And I'd, um, I'd, I'd echo a point that Giles made at the start, which is that uh, when it comes to inflation correlation, not all infrastructure assets are, are created equal. So it does really require an active approach to, to portfolio construction uh, and to achieve that, uh, that inflation protection for, for investors. So for Hickel, uh, inflation protection is one of the key four metrics that we target when putting together this diverse portfolio of essential infrastructure uh, together. Um, and in particular, when we make new acquisitions and disposals, what are, what are the key metrics that we're looking at? Inflation is a key one of those. So the four key metrics being return, yield, inflation, correlation, and weighted average asset life. Um, now, Hickel has an overall portfolio correlation of, of 0.8. Uh, this is strong relative to the peer group. And it means that if inflation was 1% higher in all, all future periods, then the return that investors could expect from Hickel would increase by 0.8% uh, or, or 80 basis points, all, all other things being, being equal. Uh, now, Kieran, given current market conditions, uh, I'm sure investors are also keen to understand what more severe shorter term scenarios look like. So we've, uh, we've provided some of those sensitivities in our, in our recent results. They're available on the website, but to take an example, if, if inflation was 3% higher than our assumption uh, for three years, then investors could expect that net asset value of the company to increase by, by 10, basis, uh, by 10 uh, pence. Rather. Thanks very much, Ed. Well, very important in this current high inflation environment. It's quite reassuring for investors to hear from you. Next question to Ed and Jars. Ed. What types of infrastructure are you investing in and how do you go about it? 
so I start by saying that we're a core infrastructure investor. It is important to reiterate that given the broadening of the infrastructure sector that's occurred over, over time. Uh, and what we're looking to invest in is essential assets, real assets uh, that deliver resilient cash flows from a protected market position. Um, and to assess this, we do have a, a, an evaluation framework that we use and we, we look across a number of key characteristics, but principally those are cash flow quality, uh, market position, how defensive is the business, um, and also how essential or critical that asset is to, to the broader, uh, broader community. And we use this to screen assets, guide our due diligence, um, et cetera. Fundamentally, though, we also believe in diversification and putting together assets right across the core infrastructure landscape, um, across different sectors, across different revenue types, across different geographies, and put together these complementary risk characteristics to create more uh, robust and, and resilient cash flows that ultimately flows through to, uh, to the dividend to investors. So across our portfolio uh, to date, this has included investments in, in social infrastructure. So things like health, education, uh, blue light, uh, as well as transportation assets, utilities, uh, and communications infrastructure as well. Thanks very much, Ed. And I'd like to ask Giles the same question. What types of infrastructure are you investing in, Giles, and how are you going about it? Well, this, this Q&A is about inflation, but the, the starting point for any discussion on revenues or assets is, is how confident you are you're going to get paid in the first place, because you can have all inflation linkage you want, but if you're not paid in the first place and you're not dealing with credit-worthy counterparties, you're in trouble from the get-go. So our assets um, are all... Um, either contractually or through legal regulatory frameworks linked to governments. So governments either pay us directly um, or they, they pay us or we're paid under a regulatory regime set up and managed by, by governments and with a force of law behind it. So that's, that's one thing. We don't want to take private sector credit. Second thing is we want to be paid broadly so we're not taking risk around how much use an asset is made of so so um, we we invest in lots of education facilities for instance but we can't really influence how many kids go to school or, or or things like that so we want to be paid according to the availability of the asset not how much not how much use is made of it so we don't inv invest in toll roads for instance because we see that as having a different risk characteristic because the revenues there depend on how many people use the road. So the government backing is important. The, the way we're paid is important. And the countries we work in are important. So we don't want to take undue political risk. We only want to invest in higher tier confident countries we're confident in, which means for us, in the UK, um, Northwestern Europe, uh, Australia, uh, the US, Canada, countries like that. So that's our, that's our key uh, focus. Uh, that's our filter, I suppose, in terms of how we choose our assets. And then we have many, many aspects of our business which are in common with, with, with Ed at Hickel. But we're looking for assets which give us that long duration, an average life of 20, 25 years for the, for the assets, and critically, assets where the payments we receive from government or which are guaranteed by government or which are regulated by government do have this inflation linkage. So we're very confident about the future for infrastructure because these macro trends we hear about all the time mean we need, inf we need, we need new infrastructure. But alongside that, we've got a strong financial discipline which keeps that focus on asset life and inflation linkage. Thank you, Giles. Andrew, your company, Impact Healthcare REIT, invests in UK healthcare real estate. What kind of assets are they? Well, UK healthcare is a very big space. It's, it's depending how you measure it, it's between 10 and 12% of UK GDP. And I think we've all learned during the um, pandemic that there are limits to what healthcare can be, what kinds of healthcare can be successfully delivered online via an iPad. The world is great, and some things work very well. But when you really need care, particularly long term, long term care, you need to be in a building where that care can be delivered successfully. So within UK healthcare, we decide to focus on elderly care for, for three reasons. So the first most basic supply and demand We're, it's the long term sector trend. We are all aging. as a society. We are aging. So we know demand for our tenants does is going to grow. Um, the second is the market we're investing in is extremely fragmented. 
um, which we think create, make, creates a very interesting investment dynamic. Because um, unlike Edward and Giles, who uh, have a lot of reinvestment risk, you can only buy one water company in one town, or you know, most cities only have one or two airports. There are a lot of assets we can buy. Um, and that creates opportunity for us to acquire things on what we think of, can be very attractive terms. We own at the moment 1.5% of the UK's fragmented LB care market. So we know we can grow creatively without bidding against ourselves. And then the final thing is that um, it's been a market that also has problems and has had, has had problems in the last 20 years. The two biggest care providers, Four Seasons and Southern Cross, went bust. And one of the issues there, we think, is they were, I don't want to criticize the owners of those, of those companies, but they were overgeared, had too much debt, and their capital was too short term. So our sector, the one we're investing, is crying out for long term permanent capital. Um, and we think we can deliver better outcomes for everyone, our shareholders primarily, as obviously we're capitalists at heart, but our tenants and the people who live in the homes. Thanks very much, Andrew. Yes, and obviously the pandemic very much put uh, old people, tell me, I don't think you're allowed to call that, them that, these days, long-term healthcare very much in the public eye. And we can, I can completely understand that we need further investments in this sort of asset. Next question. What is your outlook for your asset class, so infrastructure or UK healthcare real estate? And where are you seeing the greatest risks and opportunities? And I'm going to ask that and I'm going to kick off with Ed. Uh, well, I'd, I'd, look, I'd start by saying that despite some of the volatility that we're seeing in in the broader market, conditions do remain very supportive for infrastructure investments. So I'd, I'd say put that right at the top. Um, we're an income-focused investor. We invest predominantly in operational assets. Uh, so we're not strictly reliant or dependent on new infrastructure being developed. Um, there's plenty of assets already in existence, uh, but certainly new assets feed into the investment universe for the company uh, for future years. And, and so we are very much correlated um, over time to, to how many new assets are being created. And there's some exciting, exciting trends in that respect. Um, Currently, we do see significant opportunity to add assets to our existing high-quality portfolio, and we're seeing those really right across the, the breadth of the core infrastructure landscape. And that's spanning both traditional infrastructure sectors, those things like transportation, social infrastructure, as well as those sectors that underpin the more modern economy. Uh, and in this latter group, we'd highlight in particular um, some of the macro trends that are driving investment in communications infrastructure. So, for example, things like fibre to the home, uh, mobile towers, as well as the energy transition. So electricity wires, district utilities, district heating. And importantly, assets in these themes are increasingly within the core infrastructure segment. Uh, so high quality cash flows from essential community assets with quite defensive and protected market positions. And we expect that these macro trends will continue to drive high quality core infrastructure. Um, and they're certainly featured in, in, um, in Hickel Strong and, and visible near term uh, pipeline. Thanks very much, Ed. Uh, Giles, what's your outlook for infrastructure? Yeah. Where are you seeing the greatest risks and opportunities? I mean, it's, it's been a great journey, isn't it? Because in the first infrastructure trust was listed back in 2006, I think, on the London market. And now the infrastructure sector contains, I think it's 30 plus different investment companies focused on infrastructure. So the sector has grown hugely over the last few years as people have, value, have realized the, the, the value of, of infrastructure assets of all sorts, not just the sorts that, uh, that we deal with, but sorts which have higher risks and potentially higher rewards too. So um, you know, how is that journey going to continue? And I'm, I'm pretty positive. I'd share a lot of what um, what Ed said. I think that you know there are some big trends out there which mean that um, the governments are going to continue wanting to see new infrastructure developed, and and that those are driven by you know a variety of things. Um, 
uh, um, decarbonisation obviously is one, changing modes of transport. Um, uh, you know, if we have if we move to electric vehicles, then obviously everyone, everyone realises we need electrical vehicle charging networks. So there's some, some big trends around that. Demographics, ageing population, I'm sure Andrew has, has, that, um, has that very well covered indeed. Um, but um, you know, it's, it's even down to just the expectations of our communities. I think as, as our societies get richer, their expectations grow. So, so I think I think the need for new infrastructure is 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 pretty certain. Uh, you also asked um, about risks, and you know we are in an investment product. We see ourselves as being low risk because of that government backing we talked about earlier on. But um, if you're going to ask me to identify a single risk at the moment, it probably is a financial risk, which is that um, it's one which probably affects all real assets which is if if we do have higher inflation that filters through to higher long-term interest rates materially higher interest rates then ultimately that must have a negative impact on valuations across real estate and infrastructure thanks very much charles and andrew what's your outlook for uk healthcare real estate where are you seeing the greatest risks and opportunities I spent an earlier part of my career working in emerging markets, and I'm not sure that's changed. I think globally, for the UK too, the emerging market is the ageing population. And that creates all sorts of problems and challenging to many societies facing also opportunities. Um, so we can go on growing, doing exactly what we're doing, as long as we demonstrate what we're doing with our shelves, money is appreciative and reducing risk through more diversification. We're very confident we can go on doing that. But we are thinking, looking ahead, thinking, asking ourselves two questions. The first is we proved to be pretty resilient. The pandemic was a very testing period. And we, we and our tenants were much more resilient than people, some people expected. So that was good. But how can we build on that resilience? What have we learned? What could there be future problems? We're now the inflation, inflation's replaced the pandemic and something else will replace inflation. It's always going to be some big headwind we're all confronting. So how can we build on our resilience? And the second thing, we're, it's now hopefully, um, I hope the pandemic is now receding and we're not going to be overwhelmed by another wave of it. Um, if we, we start moving around the world again, we're, we're keen to learn who in the world is best at looking after people with dementia, which is basically what our, what our tenants do. What can we learn from other countries? Well, how can we do a better job than is currently being done in this country and how, how can we improve? There's lots of exciting things happening with technology now. Um, most of that doesn't require or need a change in the built environment. But hopefully a care home in 10, 20, 30 years time will look very different um, to what a care home today looks like. And we want to own and build and own those assets. Do you know what, Andrew, that sounds really inspiring, actually, that we're look, you're looking internationally to see who is best looking after people with dementia overseas. I, I really wish you the best of luck with that. Final question, how are you approaching the social impact in your portfolio? Um, and I'd like to ask that to Andrew. Very, um, very personal questions. I spent the whole of this morning with our team thinking, why aren't we doing a better job at that? And how do we, how do we create a, a proper database, a start point? Because people, I think people need to understand what's going on and what social impact you're, you're having but they want data. They want to understand this is what is happening in your portfolio today and, and consistent data you can report on over time to show the trends and, and positive, hopefully positive, but there will sometimes be some negative trends. Um, so we're trying to work out how to commission um, some third parties to help us create that, that, that start point. And then something someone said to me else this morning, you've got to be very careful here, but all of us on this Q&A own real assets. Um, some really important social things happen, cannot happen without those assets, but we can't claim the credit for what our tenants, operators, counterparties are doing. We need, we need to recognise where we begin and end. Um, but I think it's got to start with, with data. Thank you very much, Andrew. Yes, data is very important. You know, really, we want proof and evidence of social impact. Giles, how are you approaching social impact in your portfolio? 
Yeah, I think I think it is nuanced because it's it's very easy just to say that we invest in public infrastructure and therefore all our assets contribute to public well-being. And you know, as a trite statement, that's one hundred percent true. They all do contribute to public well-being. But you know, is that enough today to really say that? You know, if you're in a in a business where you own real assets, you're delivering returns to your investors, particularly when our wider stakeholders are 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 the public. I think it does behove us to to um, to engage and demonstrate um, social impact and, and, and positive outcomes. And I think as an industry, we are, you know, we're some way down the track. And I think perhaps we're further down the track than maybe some other real asset sectors. But I don't think we're by any means um, at a destination yet. Uh, our focus um, has also been to try and track data because I think that we, we, we feel that whilst our investors focus on financial outcomes and dividends and dividend growth and capital growth, our wider stakeholders are much more interested in, in, in understanding um, other metrics. And th- those may be how we contribute to, to CO2 reduction. They might be how we contribute to, to social inclusion. Um, and so you know, we publish a annual uh, sustainability report, which covers some, but not all of the issues you're talking about. So I think we're on a journey, but I wouldn't pretend that we're close to the uh, finishing point yet. Thank you very much, Jazz. And thank you for being quite so frank about that. <laughs> and now to you, Ed, how are you approaching social impact at Nicole? Well, I, I think it's important to, to recognise that with, with infrastructure assets in particular, um, they sit really at, on the cusp of public and private. There's an inherent um, uh, inherent interaction with the stakeholder groups that is is very real and and day to day, and therefore, I, I philosophically, we do really believe that the long term outcomes for shareholders are very closely intertwined with the outcomes for the, for the stakeholders in the community. And the, the moment you lose that the realization of that connection, you're, you're going to run into problems. Um, Hickel has a quite a large portfolio of assets, predominantly um, social assets in the community. Um, we touch over around 20 million, um, interact with 20 million people globally, one in four in the UK. Um, and so we do think that we have this particular vantage point to address the S in ESG. And, and that's really how we how we think about our, um, our approach. Now, um, I completely agree um, with, with Andrew and Giles' comments that the the inherent positioning as a social product is is good and and great, but it's not it's not where the game's going to going to be played. Um, people expect more than just the the fact that you um, are associated with essential assets when they're evaluating your your ESG credentials and performance. Uh, so we're also very focused on the active part of that. Um, so what can we do through the assets, and how can we take advantage of that positioning within the communities? Uh, to deliver something over and above um, and and in that way, make sure that our assets are um, enjoyed by the community, our, um, our clients are happy with the service that they're getting. Um, and I think that's a that's a key key component for for also where the shareholders are ultimately going to have um, the returns and income that they expect from the assets over a very long period of time, which is what uh, what Hickel seeks to do. so it is it is quite nuanced in in getting that balance right. I have to say, uh, we at the AIC are also very concerned about ESG. We introduced uh, ESG disclosures on our website, which our member companies contribute to. But we're also thinking about how we can improve those disclosures um, and improve our, our work on ESG for investment companies. I'd like to thank our managers very much for joining us today. It's been very interesting to hear how their investment companies can protect investors' returns from inflation. I'd like to emphasize that we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Investment is for the long term, and it's important to have a well-balanced portfolio. If you're in any doubt, you should talk to a financial advisor. Thank you so much for watching.